Welcome to Hudwood Park Baptist Church Online. It is hard to believe that we are already in uh, the month of June, and we are now into week two of, of June. And uh, it's, it's crazy to think of, of how the year started and where we are now, um, and just kind of what's been going on. Um, to think that at the beginning of the year, none of us necessarily saw the, the changes that were coming, but um, they came quick, and we had to adapt quickly. Uh, we're glad that we were able to make that transition back in March to go online, to be able to bring you um, live services still um, through video format. Um, but we do, we do miss the in-person gathering. Uh, I so, so miss being able to see all of your faces. Uh, we've talked about this on prayer meeting, and I've talked with others. Uh, I know that you can see me. And I know at prayer meeting I get to see some of our folks, um, but it's different not being able to see you. It's much different, and I know a lot of pastors around the country have had to adapt to this, this new idea of preaching to a camera, believing that there are people on the other side who are listening. So I know you're there, and I know you're listening, um, but we are excited to announce that Governor Murphy has lifted the stay-at-home order uh, for the state of New Jersey, and that changes are now coming and are in place uh, that directly impact the churches. So in New Jersey, he has lifted the number from indoor gatherings from 10 to 50, which will allow churches to begin reopening. Um, so if you would do me a huge favor, hidewood.org slash update. We've put out a video on there that kind of me talks about what that means for us here at Hidewood, um, what that's going to do for us, what our timeline is for coming back into the building, um, and then continue to watch that page over the coming two weeks as we're going to be continuing to put out uh, a lot of information about how we're coming back together, what it's going to look like, some of the differences. Because though we're coming back, please understand that safety is the most important thing on our minds. Uh, we are excited to be able to fellowship together, to see each other, but it's going to look different, at least for, for phase one. So our initial comeback will be, will be different because there still are some guidelines with face masks and social distancing that we have to adhere to. So check that video out. It's hidewood.org slash update. And then be watching that page over the next two weeks as we continue to, to push out information. Um, we are excited, though, that uh, we've talked about it. We've been looking forward to it. And that day is, is finally approaching when we're going to be able to come back together. So uh, we are grateful. We thank God that he's brought us through this far. And uh, we thank God that we know that he's going to continue to bring us through as we continue to slowly transition back to uh, a new normal because things will be different. So take a look at that and then be following that as well as our Facebook page. And you can find links for, for that stuff here on our Hidewood Live site. So if you're joining us on YouTube, we encourage you to check out our, our website because there's a lot more information like we're talking about that's on the website. Um, and it's, it's a great place for you to plug in. Also check out our Facebook page because that's where a lot of our community is. So uh, with that being said, we are excited that we are coming to the end of our series. We've been working through a series for the last nine weeks. So this is part nine, if you will. And a lot of times the danger of long series is is that you can lose people along the way, right? People see the, the sermon title and they go, oh, pastor's gone another week on this. When is he going to be done with this series? When are we going to move on? Well, this morning we are coming to the end. So if you've been getting tired of our Lemon series, uh, this morning you can celebrate that we are coming to the end. But we're closing with a very specific individual. As we have over the last few weeks, we've looked at a few different individuals and, and some of their struggles. With the opening five weeks, we looked at five different steps to take when life gives you lemons. And then we kind of started putting it all into application. But before we jump in and before we wrap up this morning, let's have a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you that we can come together. Lord, we thank you that we were able to make the change back in March to uh, going online, to being able to live stream to being able to continue to bring your word and your message out uh, to anyone anywhere who is listening. Lord, it, it gives an opportunity to reach those who maybe wouldn't be in our area or be able to come to our physical location. But Lord, because it's online, they can access it wherever they are. We're thankful that we can embrace technology in such a positive way. Lord, I thank you that other churches around the globe were, were so quick to do the same thing, that they saw the importance 
of continuing to bring your message to the people out there, not only their members, but to others who may be looking for answers. Lord, I thank you that there are like-minded pastors who are, are still willing to adapt and overcome to bring your message week in and week out. That we wouldn't just let this be an excuse. For as big of a transition as this was and as uh, big of an impact as COVID has had on all of our lives and continues to have, Lord, we know we're not out of the woods yet by any means. But we thank you that there were men and there were helpers in place to continue to bring your word week in and week out. Lord, we thank you that now we get to start to transition coming back together. Lord, we thank you that we are in a place where it's a possibility for us to once again gather in person and to, to worship you. So we celebrate and we look forward to that day. We look forward to um, the next two weeks to, to pass by quickly as we prepare to, to come back together in person. But Lord, above all else, I pray that it would be done in a safe manner that we would remember that there still is a global pandemic at hand, that as much as we want to be able to come back and return to normal, that for a time, things will be a little different. But we still get to be excited about seeing each other and holding on to the hope that you are still with us and you are still going to help us walk through this. So Lord, be with us this morning as we close our series out, as we look forward to communion, remembering uh, the hope that we have, what gives us hope to wake up each day and to get through that day. Lord, I pray that it would just be a great time this morning. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. This morning we're going to be taking a look in 2 Corinthians. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and flip there. If, you're, um, not having, if you don't have a Bible handy, you can go ahead and click that link on our live stream page. It'll take you right to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we're going to be looking at the life of Paul. Well, we're going to look at just a, a brief moment of Paul's life. Because if you know about the New Testament, you know that Paul has written a large portion of the New Testament. Uh, he's done a tremendous amount and had such a great impact. But as we've said, over the, this series, we've looked at five different steps that we can take, kind of in succession for when we're facing the lemons of life. And the lemons, we said, are our trials, right? James talks about the trials and the tribulations that we all will face. In 1 Peter, Peter talks about the fiery trials that we may face, right? And they talk about the testing of of our faith and knowing that the testing of our faith will produce patience and perseverance. It will make us mature believers. Jesus himself says, in this world you will have trials, but take heart, take hope. I have overcome the world. Jesus says, I've already overcome all of this. You're going to have tough times and, and hard situations, but remember, I'm so much bigger than what this world can do to you. So we looked at those five steps, and we said that if we take that five-step approach, that we can handle anything that life throws at us, right? And then we started to look at several different individuals. We looked over several different lives. We looked at Naomi, and we looked at Ruth, and we looked at Moses, right? And we looked at some of the, the big names in Scripture. We looked at Job, and we looked at Elijah, and we looked at how these different individuals dealt with their various trials. And we said that there were several mindsets, right? There are several mindsets that came when approaching trials. There was the mindset that Joseph and that Ruth had, right? Joseph and Ruth were in different situations, but both of them came with a very positive mindset. That they were going to continue to follow God and to, to embrace whatever came. That they wouldn't let it change them for the negative, that whatever lemon came into their life, they were going to take it in stride and continue to live how God called them to live or, or wanted them to live. And then you have someone like Naomi, right? And we said that instead of using the term negative Nancy, we should use the term a negative Naomi. Because Naomi literally came back to her friends as she dealt with her lemon. She loses her husband and then she loses both of her sons, when she's in Moab, and as she comes back to her friends in Israel, she says, call me Mara, which literally means bitterness. She came with such a negative mindset into that trial that, that she was almost giving up hope. She was resolved to just wallowing in self-pity, right? 
And we looked at those two and we said, who would you rather be? Would you rather be Naomi or would you rather be Ruth or Joseph? Where no matter what happens, you're going to continue to live how God called you to live. And then we looked at Moses. We looked at Moses and we looked at Job and we looked at Elijah. And we said the three of them, they all reached a breaking point. With their trials, they got to a point where things had become so overwhelming that they said that it would just be better off if they were dead. It would be better off for them if they didn't have to face, if they didn't have to walk down the road that their lemon was going to take them, that their trial was going to take them. And we've said that as we face trials, we have to choose what mindset we're going to fall into. That the choice is on us how we react to life's situations. We all react differently. No one can choose the reaction for you. You yourself are responsible for what you do when life gives you lemons. This morning we're going to look at Paul. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12 is the passage that we're going to look at, specifically verses 6 through 10, but we'll start back in verse 1. But here's a little backstory. Paul, as we come into verse 1, is wrapping up kind of his defense. Paul was a great man with a great ministry. Now, he didn't start out that way. If you know about the life of Paul, you know that Paul originally was known as one of the greatest persecutors of the Christian faith or of Christians in that time. Paul made it his mission to go around arresting believers, finding ways to bring them up on charges, bring them back to Rome and put them on trial. But then Paul has a moment with God. He has that encounter and God changes his life, right? A complete 180 degree turn where God now calls Paul and says, Paul, you are going to be one of the greatest missionaries now for my name. And so that's what he does. He embraces that life and he continues on and he's known as the Apostle Paul and he embraces the apostleship and and what that means and what that entails. And it's a very particular word, especially for that time. And what it meant, the traits of being an apostle. So as we come to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is defending himself and his right to be called an apostle. For his right to justify his ministry, what he's done. And he's been on the defense specifically to those at Corinth for the accusations that they brought against him. And they accused him of boasting in himself and that he was full of pride and that his ministry was to puff himself up. So as we come to verse 1, that's what's going on. Paul is wrapping up two chapters of defending himself and defending his ministry as being directly called by God. And as we come to verse 1, he's going to move from not only the physical things he's done, but now to the visions that God gave him directly to establish who he was. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 1, and then we'll focus in on 6 to 10. It says, Doubtless it is not profitable for me to boast. So I will move on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ over 14 years ago. Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I knew that such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Was caught up into paradise, and heard inexpressible words not permitted for a man to say. Of such a person I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my weakness. Verse 6 here. For if I desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But now I resist, lest anyone should think of me above that which he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, lest I be exalted above measure. I asked the Lord three times that this might depart from me. But he said to me, and really focus here on verse 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly I will boast in my weakness that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So I take pleasure in weakness, in reproaches, in hardships, in persecutions, and in distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
Paul had every right to boast. Paul had every right to speak with authority. As he writes to the Corinthians, as he did in these letters, he has the authority to speak the way that he did. Because of who he was, what he had been through, the call God had placed on his life, and the purpose for which Paul was doing his ministry. When he was being compared to these other people who were boasting, Paul said, look, I boast not in myself, but I boast in the things of God. You're listening to these Gentiles who are, are boasting about themselves and about things of this world, and you, you listen to them, you enable them. You continue to give them a platform to do these things, yet I speak of the things of God and you bring accusations and you accuse me. And you would come after me in my ministry. But as we get down into verse 6, he says, look, here's the thing to remember. God gave me a specific thorn in my side or a lemon that came into Paul's life. He said, and this thorn was specifically to remind me not to boast in myself. But we have something that's very interesting that's going on here as we, as we look at kind of what Paul's talking about, right? As Paul is kind of going through, he says, look, I'm not going to boast in myself. I'm going to continue to boast in God. If we go back to chapter 11 for a minute, so 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 16 to 33 is kind of his big list of his defense, but verses 23 to 29 specifically Paul says he has that right to boast in the Lord, right? Look at the sufferings that Paul has been through. This is kind of his resume and why he says he has the authority to speak the way that he speaks. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, go down to verse 23. He's talking again about the, the individuals that they were giving um, time to, to, to speak and to boast. And he says this in 22, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, and here's his list in relation to his authority. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep where he was left in the sea. In journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by my own countrymen, in perils by the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brothers, in weariness and painfulness, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, and in cold and nakedness. And he says, besides all of this, right? That's all of the physical things. But verse 28, besides the external things, the care of all the churches pressures me daily. Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is led into sin and I am not distressed? Verses 24 through 27, he lists all of the physical sufferings that he's gone through for living the calling that God placed on his life. He says, look at all of this. If you want to talk about who has the right to talk, look at my resume in comparison to everybody else. Look at my sufferings. Look at my struggles. And he said, besides all of the physical, I have the added stress of the pressures of daily caring for all of the churches. There's an interesting thing about churches and about ministry that um, you don't necessarily always understand until you're suddenly put into that position. But there's a different pressure that comes into one's life when they enter into any type of ministry. Working in the church and working in a ministry, be it a Sunday school teacher, being a part of a music team, being a part of the AV team, being a pastor. There's a pressure that's now added onto your life because you are caring for other believers. You're caring for the church. What you do and what you say and how you live is going to be scrutinized. It's going to be watched. And people are going to make judgments of the Christian church as a whole, of your specific church, and of you based on your actions, based on what you say, based on things that you do. 
And Paul is saying, look, besides all of the physical, I have the pressure of worrying about and caring for the spiritual well-being of all of these churches. If anyone has a right to boast, it's Paul. But Paul says, look, I don't. And to make sure that I don't, I've been given a specific thorn in my flesh. Back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. As he gets in here, he says, I've been given this thorn, right? Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, the thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, lest I be exalted. Something to keep him humble, something to remind him of who he was. That it was not him, but it was God working through him in ministry. But we have something very interesting in the the coming verses. Paul says, I asked the Lord three times. On three different occasions, I asked that this would depart from me, that God would take this from my life. We're never told when this is finally lifted. We're not even told what this burden was that Paul had. There's a lot of speculation, whether it be a physical ailment that Paul had or whether it be a spiritual battle, whether it be someone that he had to deal with on a regular basis, judgment. But we know that it was enough that Paul asked on three different occasions for God to remove this from his life, to get rid of it so that Paul could continue focusing on what he was doing without this distraction to constantly battle with. But God's response is a response that we all need to remember whenever we face any trial in our life. As Paul's dealing with this and Paul asks God to remove this thorn, God has that conversation back. In verse 9, we get to see God's answer specifically regarding this situation. God says this, he says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength, God's strength, is made perfect in weakness. Right? God says, my grace is enough and my power thrives in weakness. Think about the last major trial that you faced before COVID-19 happened, before January and February happened. Think about the situations that you've found yourself in throughout your life. As you reflect upon the different lemons that you faced, have you tried to get through them on your own strength? Or have you tried to get through them with the strength of God? There's an interesting thing about coming to the end of ourselves. It's a phrase that gets used often in the Christian world, right? When we come to the end of ourselves is when we come to the beginning of God. And there's a whole theological debate that you could have about that phrase and how you should use it. But what God is saying to Paul is saying, look, in your weakness, in your, your inability to to get rid of this yourself. In that weakness, my power is going to have the opportunity to shine through. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is enough to get you through anything that you're going to face. And in that weakness, my power is made perfect. God says in our pain and in our struggles, in our trials, in our lemons of life, God's power has the ability to shine through. Sometimes some of the the greatest messages or the, the greatest examples of God's power come directly from a trial that someone faces. Because it's in those moments when we examine that that we look at and we say, there is no possible way that we're gonna get through this on our own. We need a power that is beyond ours and God says, that's my power that you need. And it's here for you and it's going to help you walk through. Embrace it. Let it shine. And let my name be praised and my name be glorified. So Paul rounds out that passage by saying, look, I take pleasure in all these things. right? I take pleasure in weakness, in reproaches, in hardships, in persecutions, and in distresses for Christ's sake. Paul says, if I'm going to suffer for the name of Christ, if I'm going to be in a position 
where because of what I'm doing, because of how I'm living for God, then something negative comes into my life, then I'm going to rejoice in that. I'm going to embrace that because God is going to be glorified through that because it's no longer his own strength that he's going to rely on. Paul says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. When we get beyond our own power, when we get beyond our own limitations, that's when we can embrace true strength, and that strength is from God. When we're facing various trials, when we're facing the lemons of life, it's very easy for us to try to go it alone, right? It's human nature to respond and say, how can I fix this? For men especially, right? Men are fixers. We look at problems and we say, okay, where's the, where's the problem? Let me see the problem and now let me come up with a solution. Now let me implement this solution and we're going to see if it, it fixed it or not, right? Men are fixers. We want to fix things. We want to make things better. We want to solve problems. But when it comes to our spiritual life, everyone's on the same playing field. None of us left to our own power, our own strength, can solve all of the problems that we'll face. It's only with the power of God. It's only with his strength that we'll be able to work through all of life's lemons. There are some things that we'll face that that we can get through. Whether it be because of what we learned in the past, because of what we were taught, because of the help of others. But there are trials in our lives that we will face that there's no way we're going to be able to overcome on our own. There are things that we won't be able to do alone. And God says... Let me help you. Embrace my power. In your weakness, let my strength shine through. As we transition away from this series, and as we continue to keep in mind what's going on in the world around us, remember God's words to Paul. In our weakness, God's power is made perfect. God's grace is sufficient for us. There's nothing in life that, that the world will throw at us that God can't handle. There's nothing that we'll face that's outside of his realm of capability. There's nothing that this world can throw. There's no lemon that can pop up that is going to surprise God, that is going to give God a challenge, right? So when we face those lemons, remember God's words. My grace is sufficient for you, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. God is glorified in our weakness. Because as we've said from the beginning, it's when we face those trials as believers, as Christians, we claim the name of Christ, and we said that we serve an almighty and all-powerful God. So if we serve an all-powerful God, and then we go through the lemons of life, and we try to do things on our own and we fail, people are going to question that. But if we try to go things or go through things with God, no matter how hard that struggle is, no matter how awful that situation seems in the moment, two things will happen when we get to the end. We will get to look back and rejoice and say, look at what God has brought me through. Look at how God sustained me. Look how he protected me. Look how he provided for me in that awful time. And look at where I am now, how he's brought me out of that, right? And then the world is going to look at that same situation, and they're going to look at what you went through. They're going to look at how you were sustained. They were going to look at how bad the situation was, and they're going to say, how did you deal with that? And in that moment, that's your opportunity to say, it wasn't me. It was only through the power of Christ that I was able to get through that time in my life. And that will then open an opportunity or open a door for you to be able to share who God is with those people. It's an opportunity for us to share the love of God with others. In life, there's different trials. There's trials that we'll face because of the world that we live in. We live in sin nature. Right now, we're all facing COVID-19. COVID-19 is a direct result of a fallen world, an imperfect world. It is a consequence of sin. Not specifically that disease, but disease in general, right? Sickness and death is a result of sin. It's a result of the disobedience of Adam and Eve going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Right? We're going to face trials like that. 
We're going to face tough times, persecution, as people ridicule us for believing in God. We're going to face trials of various nature. But in all of them, remember God's words. My grace is sufficient for you. In weakness, my power is made perfect. The power of God will be able to shine through. As we wrap up this morning, and as we put everything together, take away two things from this series. Take away the five steps that we talked about in the beginning, right? Those five basic steps to go through and just quickly check off. When you face that trial, step one, immediately stop and remember who's in control. God is in control. God sees the whole big picture and he's the one who's going to walk you through it if you let him. He knows how this plays out. So step two in line with step one is let him lead you through that trial. David says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want for anything. God is going to provide everything that you need in times of good and in times of bad. So it's okay to be like sheep and let our shepherd, the creator of the universe, lead us through those tough times, right? To lead us through to the end. The second thing to take away, besides the five steps, is to take away the mentality. We looked at various individuals. Now we've looked at the life of Paul. And we looked at Ruth and Joseph. And we looked at Naomi. And we looked at Moses and Job and Elijah. The mentality that you choose when you face the lemons of life will change your experience in those trials. If you go into that trial with a negative attitude and a negative mindset, you are going to have an absolutely miserable time. If you go into it rather with a a positive mindset, sitting there going, I don't know how this is going to play out. God, I don't know what the end result is. I don't know how this all ends. I don't know what the larger impact is. But I'm going to pick step three here and say, Lord, what questions should I be asking? How are you going to use me? How, how am I going to use this for your glory? What should I be learning from this? Right? If you go in with that mentality, your experience in your trial will be drastically different. I'm not saying it will be easy. We're never guaranteed it will be easy. But it will be better than if you go into it thinking there's no hope and there's no way you're going to get through it. Go into it with a positive mindset. Lord, we don't know what's happening as we face our trials, but give us the strength and give us the courage to face them boldly. Empower us to take them one day at a time, knowing that you're with us. Take that mentality away from it. It will make your trials so much easier. Again, they won't be easy, but they will be drastically different than if you go into them with a negative mindset. Remember Christ himself told us, right? He said in John 16, in this world you will have tough times, you will have trials, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Jesus says, look, I've already overcome the world. I've come into it, I've dealt with the same things you're gonna deal with, I've, I've struggled the same way that you're gonna struggle. I've been physically abused the same way that some of you may physically be abused as you look at the life of some of the apostles and the disciples. He says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Whatever happens in this world, if you are a believer, if you're a son or a daughter of Christ, no matter what happens here, the glory and the eternity that we have to look forward to makes it worth it. Makes it worth going through so we can be with Christ. Again, in James and in 1 Peter, we're reminded to take those trials, take those tribulations, to embrace them, to count it joy, to to count it as a good thing, to rejoice in it, knowing that as you come out of this, you'll come out of it as a stronger, more mature believer. James says to count it all joy as you fall into those, those diverse temptations. Peter says, in this greatly rejoice even though now, if for a little while, you're made to suffer various trials. Count it joy, knowing that on the end, it will be worth it. When we looked at those steps 
They help us to face the lemons of life. But add to the end of that the reminder of what God says to Paul. My grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. In our weakness, God's strength will be manifested and it will be magnified. In our trials, it's an opportunity for us to bring glory to God. So embrace those trials when you face them, knowing that it'll have a benefit for you, but more importantly, it'll have a greater benefit for God's kingdom. That what Satan may want to use for evil, we can turn instead for good. In that, we win the trial. No matter what happens to us in it, if that's how we come out of it, then we've won. That's what it's all about. Our trials are, are there to help mold us and to shape us into the mature believers that God wants us to be. They equip us and enable us to continue to do ministry, to reach out to the world, to embrace others who are having the same issues. And they allow the power of God to shine through. The next time you find life throwing lemons at you, remember the opportunity that lies before you. Remember the opportunity that that lemon presents. You can take it in one of two ways, the negative or the positive. Remember that facing these trials, and in doing so, we'll be able to truly rejoice as we come out of it. That's what it's all about. Taking the negatives of life, the lemons, the sour things, and turning them into lemonade, or we said, turn them into orange juice, and leave the world wondering how you did it. Turn them into something so much better. Instead of that negative, turn it into that positive and leave others wondering what happened? How'd you do that? And how can I do the same thing? We're going to have a word of prayer and then we're going to come to a time of communion. And communion is a reminder of what Christ has done for us, how he's provided for us. Remember we said God's grace is sufficient for us and his love is so perfect that he would send his son to die for us. So that as believers or as individuals, as humans who are, are sinful in nature, who are deservant of eternal separation from God, we could receive the free gift of salvation and then be filled with the Holy Spirit. And then as we go through life and as we face the different challenges or the different lemons that the world can offer us or throw at us, we can now face those knowing that the individual in control of our life is the creator of the universe, the almighty God who loves us and cares about us and has a plan and is with us through those moments. So as we come to communion here in a moment, see how all of it ties in. That God, even in our imperfection, provided a way out for us. And as believers, he will continue to provide ways out and he will continue to provide for us through our tough times. So let's have a moment of prayer as we come to communion. Lord, as we come to the communion time and as we remember what it is that you've done for us, Lord, we are thankful for the lemons of life. Lord, we thank you that we can look back at scripture and we can look at individuals and we can learn how we should act and how we shouldn't, what we should be doing, what our responses should be. Lord, we thank you for this moment with Paul as he prayed to have this thorn from his side removed, as he prayed for this to be taken away so he didn't have to deal with it anymore, Lord, you remind us all through Paul that your grace is sufficient. Your grace will get us through everything and that your power is made perfect in our weakness. Lord, even in our, our moments of weakness, we can be strong because of your strength, because you provide for us, that you carry us through the tough times. But Lord, I pray that we would be reminded to embrace that love, that we would be reminded to embrace that strength, that we wouldn't try to go it on our own, but that we would actively remember that you're in control of all things, and you're there for us. You've, you've promised to be there for us, even to the extent that you would send your son to the cross to die for us. So Lord, we thank you for all the examples that we can learn from. But most importantly, Lord, we thank you for your love towards us. 
that no matter what we do wrong, you're still willing to take us back with open arms, that you freely give us the gift of salvation so that no matter what happens here on earth, we can spend eternity with you. So Lord, as we come to the communion table, we remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. I pray that we would remember your love and that we would live our life to show that love to the world around us. Lord, we have such an incredible opportunity right now to be the light to the world as you've commanded us to be. I pray that we would not fall in that endeavor, that we would pick up our torch and that we would go out into the world and share your love with them. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. As we come to communion, our passage is in 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11 is where we look at, as again, Paul has written to the church of Corinth. And he's written to them remembering or reminding them of the Lord's Supper. Reminding them of, of what it is that Christ did at that first supper. Right? The Passover meal was something that was celebrated for generations. But when Jesus goes into the upper room with the disciples and he breaks that bread and he, he passes the cup, he forever changes the Passover meal to a meal that now bridges not just from one culture, but to the world. Jesus takes the bread and the cup and he, he breaks the bread and says, this is my body, which is broken for you. This cup is my blood of, of the new covenant. It's my blood poured out for you. And he says, this is now symbolic of my sacrifice because of my love. At the time, the disciples didn't quite understand what it meant. This was a traditional meal that they were eating. But within 24 hours, they understood exactly what he meant as he's later arrested and, and goes to the cross. And as we come to our passage in 1 Corinthians 11, we're reminded of what it is that Jesus did. So 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. It says, I have received of the Lord that which I deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This bread is symbolic of, of the body that was broken. It's symbolic of Christ's suffering at the hands of his own people. More importantly, it's symbolic of the suffering that he dealt with because of our sin. It deserves, or we deserve, to have the beating and the punishment that he went through. But he loved us enough that he would take it so that we could once again be reunited with him. Before we partake, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love. Lord, we thank you that Christ would go to the cross. That your son, knowing the path that lay before him, knowing what his purpose was and his calling was and knowing what he would deal with, the pain and the suffering. Lord, he willingly went to that cross. He loved us and loved you enough to take that upon his shoulders so that we didn't have to. So that once and for all, the sacrifice could be made for the atonement of sins. Father, we don't deserve this and we could never earn it. But because of your love for us, you've provided it for us. I pray that we would never take that for granted. That as we each month partake of the bread, that we would remember the pain and the suffering that Christ went through on our behalf. So that we get to one day experience the true joy of living with you in your presence. As you wanted us to be able to do from the beginning. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Again in verse 24 it says, When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together. Each month as we come to the cup, the cup is again symbolic of Christ's pain and Christ's suffering. Of the blood that he shed on our behalf. The crown of thorns that was pressed into his skull. It's not small thorns. If you've ever been pricked by a rose bush, it doesn't feel great. But the thorns that were pushed into Christ's head were most likely an inch or more long. It was designed to cause pain and to cause suffering, to shed blood. And then again with the beatings as his back was ripped open and his blood poured out on our behalf. That's what this cup represents. 
the physical abuse that Christ took. And then finally, as the nails pierced his hands and his feet, and he goes to the cross. All of that pain and all of that suffering that we deserve to deal with, Christ dealt with. And again, that's what's represented here. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again that Jesus knew what was in store. He knew the physical pain that was coming. But he didn't shy away. Lord, we know that he he came to you and he said, if there was any other way to let this cup pass from him, to let it happen. But if this was the only way to provide a, a, a sacrifice for all mankind once and for all, to cover sin, then he would go through with it. And he would go to the cross and he would deal with that pain and that suffering on our behalf. Lord, we thank you that he was willing to do that. That the punishment that we deserve is not ours. That Christ already took it upon himself. Lord, as we come to the cup and we remember the blood that he shed, his blood that should have been ours. I pray that we would never forget what this represents. The power that is behind it. The power of love that is behind it. And Lord, that we would take that love to the world around us. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. It says, in the same manner he took the cup after he had supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Verse 26, as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. We do this monthly as a reminder. A reminder of what it is that Christ went through. But we also do it as a reminder of what we get to look forward to. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back. That's the hope that we have. That's what gives us joy in our life, knowing that Christ is coming back. And when Christ returns, be it in our lifetime or in the time after, that we will get to be reunited with him. That we will get to go on and we will finally get to live in eternity. And then, at that point, the lemons of this world no longer exist. But until that day comes, continue to embrace life's lemons. Continue to remember the sacrifice that was made for you. And continue to remember the power that continues to be with us every day as we go through life. And that's the power of God and his love for us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for communion. We thank you that we get to proclaim your death until you come back. Lord, we look forward to that second coming. Lord, we look forward to the time when we get to be called away from this world and we get called into your presence. And then we get to spend eternity, something that for the human brain is just uh, so hard to comprehend, the idea that there will be no end to the joy that we will get to experience living with you, that we will be given new bodies and new life, and we will spend that time with you. Father, I pray that we would live that out, that it wouldn't be just a once a month thing as we take communion, but Lord, that we would live each day with that on our mind, that as we face the lemons of life, as we face the tough times, as we face the changes in society, in the world around us, as, as we go through all of this, Lord, I pray that we would hold on to that hope of our future. Lord, that we would hold on to your love and we would hold on to your power. And that we would then be the light to the world and say, look, no matter what happens in this life, there's so much greater beyond. There's so much greater in store for us if we know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. So Lord, we are grateful for what Christ did on the cross for us. We know that we would never be able to earn our way to heaven. We could never do anything to justify ourselves to get there. But you loved us so much that you would send your one and only son to deal with the pain and the punishment that we deserve so that we could spend eternity with you. That we can accept that free gift of salvation knowing that our future is secure. So Father, we thank you that we have this promise. 
And I pray that we would show that to the world around us. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. As a brief reminder, hidewood.org slash update is our, our page for all of our updates. We are excited about what's happening right now in the state of New Jersey as far as some of the restrictions that are being lifted. We would ask this. Continue to be in prayer. Continue to pray for wise decisions to be made. Continue to pray for not just our state, but for our world as a whole. That as we continue to navigate this global pandemic and as countries start to lift restrictions, that people would continue to use, uh, I want to say common sense, but common sense is not too common anymore. Continue to use wisdom, right? Pray for wisdom, that people would make wise choices because the only way that we get through this is together making wise choices. We're excited to say that we will be back together soon. June 28th is our, our first day back together. Again, check out the video and the information on hydewood.org slash update. And uh, we are excited that we will very soon be back together face to face. And we'll be able to do this together again, worshiping as a family. Because we are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Right now we're separated but soon we will be back together. Let's have one final word of prayer before we leave. Father God, we thank you that we are coming closer to that point. Lord, that we see that light at the end of the tunnel. We've talked about it for about a month now, and we're finally getting to see it. Lord, we looked forward to it, and now it is, it is quickly arriving. But as we get ready to regather, as we get ready to reopen the doors of the church and to come back together in person, Lord, I pray that we would do it with wisdom. Lord, that we would make wise choices for the safety and the benefit of all. That we would take the health into consideration of not just ourselves, but of those around us. Lord, that we would remember that brotherly love and remember it's not always just about us, but that we should be looking out for those around us. That we should be caring for others and we should be making decisions accordingly. So Lord, as we get ready to get back together, as we get ready to uh, come back in one building. I pray that we would do it carefully and that we would do it uh, in a way that is, um, just provides the best opportunity for us to safely gather and not worry about what's going on, but to be uh, here focusing on why it is that we gather, and that's to bring honor and glory and praise to your name. So Lord, be with us this week. Give us the strength that we need, your strength, so that even in our weakness, we can be strong as we face the lemons of life. We know that you provide that for us. I pray that we would be reminded to lean on you for it. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.